Today, it's my pleasure to introduce you all to the president of ISI, Johnny Burka. Uh, Johnny graduated from Hillsdale College with degrees in French and Christian studies and earned a graduate degree in theology from La Faculté Jean Calvin, did I get that right? <laughs> in France. Johnny began his career at ISI where he served as a development officer. He returned to ISI after four years at the American Conservative where he served as executive director and acting editor. Johnny has appeared on Fox News and Fox Business and written for the Washington Post, the Richmond Times Dispatch, First Things, The American Mind, and the Intercollegiate Review, among other publications. Uh, he has been a Lincoln Fellow at the Claremont Institute and has participated in academic fellowships at Washington College and the Trinity Forum. Johnny lives in Pennsylvania with his wife, Amanda, and today Johnny will be speaking to us on two cheers for principled conservatism. All right, well, good afternoon. It's wonderful uh, to see you all here and to join you at our honors conference. I think this is probably uh, the favorite week of the entire year uh, for the staff at ISI, because we get to pick our, our 10 favorite professors from around the country and our best students. Uh, and it's really an opportunity not only to learn uh, the foundational principles of Western civilization and the American founding, but also to build friendships. Uh, I don't know how many uh, alumni have told me that here at the Honors Conference is the place where they've met their spouse, where they've uh, you know, picked the groomsmen who would serve in their wedding. They even started companies with people that they met at ISI's Honors Conference. So I hope that you find uh, the company to be as edifying as they did. And I also hope that you'll continue to stay in touch with ISI once you go back to your campus. And then when you graduate, uh, get involved with ISI's alumni programs. Uh, so the title of my talk today is Two Cheers for Principled Conservatism, and I hope to explain to you uh, why I, I am not willing at this point to give principled conservatism three cheers. Uh, so it is my thesis today that conservatism, and by extension America, is suffering a crisis of character, not principles, and a crisis of praxis, and not ideas. So a crisis of character, not principles, a crisis of praxis and not ideas. And we're gonna go on a little bit of a journey from more what's going on in contemporary politics, dive a little bit into history, and then I'm gonna end with some very practical advice for you. So a crisis of character, what do I mean by that? Well, to put it simply, uh, I mean that the people who represent the leadership class in America, the elites, if you want to call them that, the people that run the major institutions of, of our society, from our politics to our culture uh, to the business community, uh, with a few notable exceptions, are not virtuous people. They are not virtuous people. That is, they do not possess individual self-command or control of their passions. Uh, they do not heed the admonition of St. James uh, in his epistle to tame the tongue, which he says is a restless evil, which can set your whole life on fire. Uh, the fire actually begins in hell, and you think, well, if it can do that to someone's individual life, what can it do to a nation if you do not have leaders who know how to tame the tongue? Uh, they promote policies and products that encourage licentiousness, consumerism, and debt. Uh, most likely because their own personal lives are marked by licentiousness, consumerism, and debt. Uh, for them, politics is totalizing. Uh, there is no horizon beyond what happens in this life, which means that for them, politics is everything. It is all-consuming, zero-sum game. Uh, they lack sincerity, and what I mean by that is they often advocate, uh, advocate things they don't necessarily believe in or they don't actually have a plan uh, uh, to act upon it, they just, basically they pick battles for the sake of the political points uh, that they can score. So there's a, an aspect of, of fakeness, insincerity uh, in the leadership class we have today. Uh, they intentionally uh, um, you, use provocation to sow, sow division for the sake of getting earned media, right? And they actually count out the number of dollars that they get from the provocative statements that they say by how often uh, the news or other publications cover their work. Now, when I say so division, I, I do think division is, um, is an essential part of politics. I think there are very important pressing challenges facing the country, and it, it's okay to sometimes take the glove off, get in the ring, and you know, fight for what you believe in. So this is not uh, sowing division for the sake of solving real 
policy challenge, there's a real cultural challenge, is this is sowing division for its own sake to explicitly get earned media, which is something that's very common for political figures. Um, they're not virtuous in the sense of, uh, they're just not excellent. They're not, they're not that great of people. What I mean by that is you, know, you encounter most political, you know, many political figures, at least the ones that I've encountered, particularly in Congress, they're just not that impressive. You can imagine them being a jock in high school who's maybe like the number six or seven player like on the basketball team. <laughs> then you know, they go to a good college, but they're not really at the top of their class. They graduate, maybe they inherit a family business, or they make their way up into a company to be like a VP, but they're not really the CEO. They get into politics because they like to hear themselves talk. And when they get to DC, they basically get uploaded with like a, it's like a memory stick, or you know, so there's sort of a cloud drop of like the basic talking points from some establishment, right of center, left of center, foundation, or maybe the, the various industries that are represented in their dis district just kind of, kind of upload them with bullet points. They sort of regurgitate these ad nauseum. And there's not really, to the extent that they actually change their political positions to meet uh, you know, the current moment or crisis, it's normally because there's like a 25-year-old, someone who's, you know, like three years older than you, who's actually read a bunch of stuff and has like put this stuff together for them and convinced them that it makes good political sense for them to embrace it. So then they'll like switch their whole political platform based on what a 25-year-old types up, types up for them. So you might be able to have more influence than you think sooner than you think. Uh, so, sort of this is the state of the, the political leadership class that we have. Uh, and then their end game, and I think this is really applies on the right or the left, you know, it's not like Aristotle talks about in the ethics, it's not sort of aiming an arrow at some, you know, conception of the good or the common good that should order society. Really the end game, whether they're using the levers of business or the levers of the government or whether it's a fusion of the levers of business or government, is to liberate the individual from all constraints while amassing as much power for themselves as possible. Uh, so that's, that's, uh, that's sort of my take on why there's a character crisis in our leadership class today. Uh, now, how does that map on to the various political uh, parties and the, the dynamics that we face in our politics? Uh, well, on the right, I would say there are basically two camps. And what I'm talking about on the right is I'm not talking about you know, the smart conversation that you might hear tomorrow where you have Dan McCarthy defending his vision of nationalism and then Sam Goldman making the case for fusionism. I'm not really talking about those divisions. I'm just saying like mainstream Republican Party politics, DC politics, what are the divides? And basically you have one camp uh, for whom the only lesson that they learned from the Trump era uh, is that Trump is a fighter, therefore we need to be fighters. And, and what they, they, they mostly mean by that is that we have all the answers figured out, it's just time to get nasty. And, and practically speaking, that means getting mean on Twitter and writing angrier blog posts. Uh, and this is actually, it's like, I, I, it sounds like I'm trivializing a bit, but it's actually like, it's actually real. Like I've been on calls with the president of like $50 million DC based conservative think tanks where they literally say like the only lesson is like we have everything figured out. The only lesson to take away from Trump is that we've, we've been too nice. So now we need to get mean. Like that's the, that's the level of depth in the, the thinking. Uh, and then on the other side, you basically have uh, establishment uh, Republicans who don't like the get nasty, and I can kind of, I understand why they don't like that approach, but basically instead of, um, you know, offering up concrete solutions to the challenges that we face today, basically just double down on the worst policy decisions of previous Republican administrations. Uh, they cozy up to uh, you know, left-wing, very establishment media outlets, Washington Post, New York Times, and they're basically paid to be the, the quote-unquote conservatives who hate up and beat up on other conservatives while they pretend to be principled, right? And so that's, I, I'm, again, I'm not going to name names, but you could easily probably list five or ten people who would fall into this category. So that's broadly the state of, of right-wing politics. Uh, on the left, you basically have two camps. You have the populists, sort of the Bernie Sanders left uh, that assesses things mostly through the angle, through the lens of class. 
Uh, I think uh, on some issues, they actually point their finger on serious problems facing America today, exorbitant you know, income inequality. Uh, you know, they, they hate Jeff Bezos just as much as a lot of right-wingers hate Jeff Bezos. Uh, but by and large, this faction uh, doesn't really have a lot of influence and a lot of power uh, because they're up against, on the other side, the oligarchy, the left-wing oligarchy, which really uh, dominates uh, you know, big tech, Wall Street, uh, Wall Street and Hollywood, uh, and and for these people, their their real goal is to to entrench. Actually, let me let me put it a different way. Uh, the, they basically are the definition of privilege. They embody privilege in its truest sense. That is, they control all almost all the money, almost all the flow of information, almost all the power in the country. And their main goal is to entrench and protect their own privilege, while they do two things. One, while they beat up on people who reject their expertise. So they actively are trying to shame anyone in the country who, who doesn't agree uh, with their expertise. Uh, and then they cover up for uh, whatever um, terrible things they do in terms of their business practices or otherwise by embracing the cause of social justice, which gives a patina of legitimacy um, to their quest to maintain their entrenched uh, power. So this is the state of things on the left. And then you basically have this right and this left, sorry, the right and the left, uh, fighting against each other in the public square, and then it gets, it's basically gets pretty messy from there. Uh, because on one side, the right, uh, I'm gonna say the right is dominated by exploitation and exhibition, and the left is dominated by arson and treason. So let me, let me unpack what I mean by that. Exploitation, so on the right, you, you tend to have uh, a lot of voters you know, maybe they're from, you know, the American heartland, people that are out of the coastal cities, uh, you know, who have a lot of serious cultural concerns. They have a lot of grievances about um, the elite class. You know, they feel like they've been betrayed. They feel mocked. They feel like they're the losers of, of globalization. And so they have a lot of legitimate fears about where the country is headed. But the political leaders on the right tend to take those legitimate fears and exploit them as much as possible for their own political game, and then stage uh, you know, an exhibition of sorts where they basically act out a fight. Then they, they convince people we're on the cutting edge of a fight, uh, and we're sort of materializing all of your fears, and we're gonna capitalize on them, and we're gonna win. And, and you could, you know, this, I think there are two manifestations of this. One of it, you have the, um, the stop the steal sort of uh, rallies and attempts, you know, after the November election. I think there was uh, Pedro Gonzalez reported in American Greatness that, you know, that, that Trump had basically raised tens of millions of dollars. I think he had something like 60 or 70 million dollars that was explicitly raised for the purpose of challenging uh, the election in courts. Uh, and what the people didn't realize is that uh, you had to give $8,000 uh, in order for any of the money to go to challenge elections. And so what happened to the first 8,000? Well, five of it went into Trump's personal political pack, which covered you know, travel expenses and things like that, nothing to do with the election. The other three went to the RNC's pack, and then the remaining money went to election litigation. Uh, but the, the sad thing about this, uh, of the various sad things about it, is that most of the gifts were low dollar gifts from poor, working class and middle class people from the, from the American heartland who actually believed that this was gonna overturn the election and it was really just a giant grift, right? It was, it's all, it was all fake, but the fight seemed real. You know, you have a similar thing with uh, people trying to raise money, crowdsource money to build the wall and, and it turns out, you know, a bunch of, the, there's hardly any wall that was built. Most of the money goes to fund, you know, travel expenses at resorts and first class flights and private jets and things like that. Uh, so that's how the right is basically taking this fight to the left. On the left, you have uh, arson and treason. Uh, so arson, you have uh, you know, sort of a cultural arson, a rejection of our patrimony, purging of the great books from the curriculum, a rejection of our inheritance, uh, whether it's as, as Christians, as Americans, as people of the West. You have literal arson in the sense of rioting, burning down American cities, defunding police, letting sort of violence escalate, uh, which really, again, only hurts ordinary people. And then you have uh, sort of excessive lockdowns, which put all these small businesses 
out of, uh, out of business while lining the pockets again of people like Jeff Bezos. And then you have treason, which is, I think, a, a, a serious charge. But what I mean by that is basically the people that run the companies in Hollywood, Wall Street, Silicon Valley, um, they will do any, basically they oppose anything that prevents them from lining their pockets with money from the Chinese and from the Chinese Communist Party. They value uh, that access to those markets more than America's national interests. And so Hollywood will censor its movies. If you're the NBA, you'll pretend to be as woke as possible, but you'll silence a player if they stand up for Hong Kong or for uh, slavery in Xinjiang province. Um, and the, the list, you know, Wall Street's similar. If, if there are tariffs that are put on uh, China to try to decouple from their economy for national security reasons. You'll have Jamie Dimon and all the CEOs from Wall Street come down, you know, in, in the pack and literally like meet with everyone in the White House and just basically stay there and not leave until they, they get everything watered down because for them, loyalty to the country doesn't mean as much as, as making money. Uh, and so this is basically the, the state of the, like the mainstream right and left as they fight today. Uh, and so if that sort of makes you feel uncomfortable, which I think it, sh it should or it ought to, uh, I would then like to say something that probably makes you feel even more uncomfortable, which is the state of our politics today is really a mirror of our own individual souls, right? This is a reflection of us as individual selves, um, basically not having any restraint. There's no self-control. It's uh, Radiohead had a song, Idiotic, where the chorus was everything all of the time, right? So this is really, what we're seeing in politics is an extension of a people as a whole that are not virtuous, that have no sense of restraint. Uh, and it does, there is sort of a permeable membrane from the individual that lacks restraint and that projects uh, their vices onto society, but also laws and institutions in society form individuals. So there is a give and a take between this. Uh, but I do believe that as, as conservatives, especially if we care a lot, a lot about the state of the country, getting our own souls and our own house in order and learning virtue and practicing self-restraint is absolutely the first fundamental step uh, that needs to be taken. So that's the crisis of character. Uh, why do we not have a crisis of principles? Well, there are two, two main reasons why I don't think we have a crisis of principle on the right today. Uh, the first one is I think uh, too many conservatives confuse principles for policies. Um, so if the policies change or they're different than the policies that we had 30 years ago, uh, that means that we must have abandoned our principles. And I just, I just don't think that's true, right? If now we don't think it's as good of an idea to have free trade with China as we did in 2000 or two, you know, two, when they entered the World Trade Organization, we think we need a shift there. That's not an abandonment of principles. That's a different policy for different for circumstances. If we don't think a regime change war in Africa or Iraq is as good of an idea as we used to, again, not a change of principle, change of policy. If we have concerns about uh, massive tech companies uh, literally colluding and strategizing with the federal government to silence uh, free speech of Americans. Uh, so, we're, so we're entertaining the idea that maybe we need to, to threaten them or enforce some antitrust action against them. Again, not a crisis of, of principles. It's a prudential change in policy based on the circumstances. Uh, going a little bit further than that, I really don't see, even if you were to uh, give some credence to the idea that principles and policy are the same thing, even if you were to sort of fuse these two together. Uh, I really uh, actually think that many of the principles that are embraced by what you might call the new right or the realignment or common good conservatism are really just old American principles. Uh, I like to hearken back to uh, George Washington and defend what I call a Washingtonian vision of conservatism. And I think there's basically three components to that, social conservatism, economic patriotism, and foreign policy realism. And that's all undergirded by a strong but limited federal government that binds all citizens of the union together. So I think that vision is laid out pretty clear if you dive into uh, Washington's uh, speeches. Um, and so I don't really see that as, a, as an, a, a, you know, something new, something to be concerned about as much as a hearkening back uh, to an older tradition. And finally, um, 
wrapping up the point on principled conservatism, uh, just a word of guidance for principled conservatives, because I do believe having principles is important, uh, actually relates to uh, the history of the, the place where ISI is headquartered. So ISI is headquartered in the Brandywine Valley, which extends from Wilmington, Delaware, into Chester County. This is just south of Philadelphia. It's a beautiful place, rolling hills, very uh, verdant. And in this place, there's something that's been described as a historian, uh, by a local historian, as the Brandywine Paradox. And uh, I think it represents a type of fusionism that actually predates uh, Frank Myers in defense of freedom by over 150 years. And this was a fusionism born out of uh, practice born out of concrete historical circumstances. So in the year 1800, um, uh, Jefferson invited the DuPont family to escape, uh, escape revolutionary France and come to the United States. Uh, so the DuPont family came to the US. Uh, Alexander Hamilton actually drew up the, the contract for their land and they settled there. And uh, what they did there, uh, I think is pretty instructive. On one side, just about a mile from ISI's headquarters, uh, in Wilmington, uh, it was basically the seat of industry for the early American nation, right? They were, there was entrepreneurial activity, economic growth, dynamism, innovation. Uh, there were powder mills, there were paper mills. Uh, it was a, a really an industrial hub for the United States, which was absolutely essential for the US, establishing both political and economic independence from Great Britain and for uh, defeating the British, uh, or, or sorry, for, for basically in the War of 1812 for protecting our, our sovereignty. And then on the other side of ISI, about a mile in the other direction, um, the DuPonts established a place where they preserved uh, conservatism, history, conservation, art, high culture, sort of all the old, old world virtues um, that they had when they were in Europe. And so these two things, industry, uh, economic growth and dynamism on one end, and then art, high culture, tradition, and conservation on the other end, literally live together in the same place. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that, that type of mentality, fusing these two together, uh, is something that we want to instill in ISI students, especially when they come to visit our headquarters. But I would st stress that it's not the just invention of sort of abstract reasoning. It's not saying like, okay, how do we, how do we take Roger Scruton and Peter Thiel and like have them come up with some intellectual synthesis that puts us all together? No, it'd be more like how, if, you, if there was a, a concrete challenge uh, where the future of America literally depended on it, and you had to have Roger Scruton and Peter Thiel in a room, and they had to figure it out. Like, what would they do? What would that look like? And so I think whenever we're talking about fusionism, I think it's important that it's actually rooted in concrete circumstances, concrete history, and even in the local place, the geography of a place uh, that ends up sort of instilling um, the, the program that flows from that. So what is the solution to the character crisis? Well, I think that's, that's challenging because we'd like a quick fix to the character crisis, and a character crisis takes a long time to fix. But basically, I think there are, there are three things. There's one, mastering our own individual self. There's, number two is participating in virtue-forming institutions, whether it's institutions like marriage or whether it's local institutions, institutions like the church. And then I think the third thing, which uh, hopefully is uh, what's happening here at the conference, is looking to history for examples that can inspire us uh, to be more virtuous people. And so turning to history, I'm actually going to give you uh, three examples here. And each of these three examples embody two virtues apiece. So I'm going to start with George Washington. Uh, if you look at George Washington's farewell address, there are really two things that stand out to me that are relevant for us today. The first one is love, and the second one is humility. Uh, in terms of love, I think what shocks me every time that I read it is the tenderness uh, and the affection that he has for America, right? It's, 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 so, it's so palpable when you read uh, the farewell address. He says, cherish a cordial, habitual, and immovable attachment to America. Think of it as the palladium of your political safety and prosperity. Watch for its preservation with jealous anxiety. He goes on, citizens by birth or choice of a common country, that country has a right to concentrate your affections. And so you see, this is not sort of the, the advice of a, a dispassionate 
old man. This is a grandfatherly advice uh, for a man who loves his country almost more than anything else. And, and in, in spite of all its flaws, in spite warts and all, he's able to have this sense of affection for the American nation. And then in terms of humility, he goes on, and it's hard to imagine a political... Um, political figure uh, being so humble today, but basically he goes on at the end to apologize for all of his faults, known or unknown, and he looks forward to his retirement, and his retirement isn't just going off to sort of gratify himself, blow some money in some someplace, but his, his retirement is really a love of and participation in the country that he built. He talks about it as a sweet enjoyment of partaking in the benign influence of good laws under a free government the ever favorite object of his heart and his happy reward. So I think that we have uh, a lot to learn as we uh, leave this conference just about love and humility from George Washington. Uh, the second person uh, that I'd like to highlight is Sullivan Ballou. You might have read a short letter that Sul Sullivan Ballou wrote in uh, your American history courses. But basically, Sullivan was from Rhode Island. Uh, he fought in the Civil War in the Battle of Bull Run. He was about 30 years old, uh, so about my age. He had a couple young kids and a wife. And uh, it was late one night. He couldn't fall asleep a couple days before the Battle of Bull, Bull Run. He's laying in camp, and he's surrounded uh, by 2,000 men that are sleeping all around him. And he has this feeling of calmness and peace that comes over him. And he decides to take his pen out and write a letter to his wife. And in the letter, he says, I quote, he is sus I am suspicious that death is creeping behind me with a fatal dart, and at this time, I'm communing with God, my country, and thee. He says that in reference to his wife and his family. And so as he's lying there, he's examining his conscience, and he's saying, wow, I'm really, I have peace about this. I know what I'm about to do. You know, what, is, it, is that wrong? Should this be upsetting me more? And he writes to his wife, I've sought most closely and diligently and often in my breast for a wrong motive in hazarding the happiness of those that I love, and I cannot find one. A pure love of my country and the principles I have advocated, and the name of honor that I love more than death, has called upon me, and I have obeyed. Uh, so he, he goes on to describe the strong wind of his love of country overcoming him, bearing him like chains onto the battlefield, where he would die several days later. And uh, you know, my question for you all is, would you, would you do the same? As you look to the leaders of our country, would they do the same? You know, I think the answer is absolutely not. They'd send some, some kid from Alabama to die in some war that's far more pointless than the Civil War, right? And so there's a sense of piety, there's a sense of duty uh, that Sullivan Ballou exhibits uh, when it comes to God, his country, and his family uh, that I think is instructive today in helping to inspire us in this character crisis. And then finally, the last person that I will turn to is Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, so Teddy Roosevelt em embodies two virtues uh, that I think are very important as we think about fighting the political battles of our time, and those two virtues are goodness and courage. Uh, and I think it's very important that goodness and courage go together uh, because we're going to need courage for the, the political challenges and fights that we have ahead of us, but I think we have to remember that if that courage is not also rooted in goodness and virtue, will be no better than the people that we're trying to defeat. Uh, so Teddy Roosevelt here is writing about the founders of our country. And he says, this country cannot afford to have its sons less than men, but neither can it afford to have them other than good men. If the strong man has not in him the lift towards lofty things, his strength makes him only a curse to himself and his neighbor. And this is true in private life as well as public. If Washington and Lincoln had not in them the whipcord fiber of moral and mental strength, the soul that steels itself to endure, to endure disaster unshaken with grim resolve to wrest victory from defeat, then one could not have founded nor the other preserved our mighty union. So there's a sense of courage, of grit, of strength. But then he goes on to say, but no less is it true that if either had been influenced by self-seeking ambition, by callous disregard for others, by contempt for the moral law, he would have dashed us down into the black gulf of failure. Woe to all of us if ever as a people we grow to condone evil because it is successful. We can no more afford to lose social and civic decency and honesty than we can to, 
then we can afford to lose the qualities of courage and strength. And so I think this is an, a rather ominous warning for us. He says, you know, if you want to avoid taking the country down into the black gulf of failure, you know, embrace goodness along with your courage. So love and humility, piety and duty, goodness and courage. To close, I'd like to talk a little bit, shifting gears, uh, about the second point of my thesis, which is that conservatism suffers a crisis of praxis, not ideas. Why not ideas? Well, when ISI was founded in 1953, we were really the only name in the game. If you were a conservative, if you were political, if you were intellectually curious on campus, you got involved with ISI. We were the only institution around. Uh, and in 2021, we find ourselves in a different situation. There's literally a thousand flowers that are blooming, right? There's a thousand points of light. Uh, I do want you all to get involved and stay involved with ISI. I do want you to read Modern Age, right, which is our, the journal that we publish, uh, and uh, have your ISI experience be something that extends throughout the course of your life. But there are also a dozen other programs that you can get involved with and that I would encourage you to get involved with, from the Hertog Foundation to the Hudson Institute to American Moment, to Claremont, to the Witherspoon Institute, right? In terms of journals, uh, you have Modern Age, you have First Things, you have National Affairs, American Affairs, Public Discourse, Law and Liberty, Claremont Review of Books, The American Conservative. It's literally endless, right? And I don't think it's, it's superfluous. I mean, these are all publications that I enjoy reading, that I could literally make a full-time job of doing nothing but reading them. And so while I'm very pessimistic about the state of uh, sort of the mainstream kind of uh, right-wing politics in America. I'm actually very encouraged about the energy and the dynamism that I see going on in the conservative uh, intellectual movement at this time. So I don't think there's a crisis of ideas. I think we've got a lot of creative, interesting ideas, and I hope you continue to learn them, embrace them, and explore them, uh, especially the very different flavors and styles and tones uh, that you can find out today. Uh, however, I do think there is a crisis of praxis. That is, I think we have many thinkers, but few doers. Uh, I can speak from this from, from several levels. One is just as an employer. It's much easier to find someone who uh, is really smart, who has creative ideas, because there's, there's literally hundreds of people right, who have great ideas. But the challenge is if you're looking for a job, as someone, if you're looking to make it on your ideas, the competition is super fierce, right? If you apply for a job as a professor to Hillsdale College, you might have 80 or 100 applicants applying for one job, right? Similarly, you can count the names of the, the publications that I mentioned, which seems like a lot, but there might only be like six or eight of them. And so like how many people do you think get to be the editor of those publications? It's like one in 100 or one in 1,000. And so it's, it's much harder for me if I'm making a hire that's, that's uh, you know, on the intellectual side, you have a, a lot of people to pick from, and the person that you pick for the job is really like the best of the best, you know? Uh, whereas on the, the practical side, if you're looking for a database manager, if you're looking for a fundraiser, if you're looking for people with practical skills to do things at your organization, those positions are going to sit open for like six months, and you're going to rack your brain trying to find someone. Uh, I had a conversation yesterday with... Um, the woman that runs Hillsdale's Barney Charter School Initiative. And she said, you know, we can hire a lot of teachers, but like, it's really hard for us to find administrators. And so they have a whole program to try to train the right teachers to be administrators. Uh, moreover, I think that if you actually do want to share your ideas and you want your ideas to have an influence, it's much better to learn a practical skill that can make you invaluable to your organization. And then as they come to rely on you as like the indispensable man or woman in that particular area, then you're going to be able to share your ideas, and your ideas will get more traction. Uh, so I'm going to conclude uh, with 17 very short pieces of practical advice for you uh, that are not intellectual at all, uh, but have helped me uh, when I was in your shoes 10 years ago. And you can feel free to reject them uh, or accept them as you see fit. Uh, so the first one is mentors. Uh, stay close to your mentors always. Uh, this was 
uh, terribly important for me. I remember I had a professor, Joseph Prudham, when I was doing a fellowship program, who literally spent three months working with me to get one single article published. I mean, he literally spent hours. He bought me breakfast after breakfast, poured himself into helping me get this article into perfect condition so that I could publish it, right? Uh, that's crazy, and, and he, it's not like I paid him or anything, right? That was just like time and energy that he was pouring into me. Similarly, as you go on throughout your life, you know, just keep your mentors updated, even if it's like a short email, like every six months, so they know you're alive, they know what you're doing. Like, they're gonna have job opportunities that come to them, and the first thing in their mind is, you know, people will ask them all the time, hey, I need to hire someone to do this. They're gonna probably think of one or two people. There probably could be 20 people that they think of, but they think of the one or two people that email them on occasion or meet them for breakfast when they're traveling. Similarly, when you get a you know, new job, some of these mentors are on boards of organizations, they're gonna go to bat for you in the hiring process. And then you know, maybe you make a mistake in your life and everything comes crashing down, they're the ones who you give a call who can help you to pick up the pieces. Uh, secondly, friends. Uh, in terms of friends, find friends that are more ambitious and virtuous than you are. Uh, because it's, it's literally true, you, uh, you rise to the level of your friends or you sink to the level of your friends. Uh, so find ones that are better than you and you'll find yourself rising to their level. Number three, uh, credibility can be transferred by association. What I mean by that is on points number one and number two, people, their, their opinion of you is gonna be based on who are your mentors, who are your friends, and what institutions are you involved with. Uh, and that can be to your benefit or to your detriment, uh, but to your benefit, you can really leverage that. You know, no one, unless you were born to famous parents or have a ton of money, like no one's really gonna know who you are when you're 20, 22 and you graduate college, but they might know who, you know, Jeff Pellett is if he writes you a le letter of recommendation, right? They might know Elizabeth Corey. They might know other people in your life that you're associated with. They might know the college that they went to, that you went to, and so they're gonna give you the benefit of the doubt based on your affiliations. Uh, number three, practice self-knowledge and self-discipline. In terms of self-knowledge, uh, I would encourage you to keep a journal. Some of the most successful like, CEOs that I know, like you know, an incident arose and I was talking to this one CEO and I asked him you know, what happened back in like you know, 2003. And he was able to say, okay, hold on one second. He went to his bookshelf, he pulled out a journal from 2003, he flipped to the month of May, literally to the date, and he knew exactly like what happened on that day, right? So you could use it either to process your feelings, but also to just kind of keep track of what has happened, the people that you've met, the conversations that you've had throughout the course of your life. Uh, in terms of self-discipline, uh, I'm just gonna come out and say it. I think religion is the foundation for self-discipline. Uh, Psalm 103 tells us that the Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. That is really what life is about, no matter what you're doing, no matter what stage of life you're in. Uh, so I'd encourage you to have a prayer rule to wake up, wake up in the morning and first thing to acknowledge uh, Almighty God sitting on his throne. And secondly, I would encourage you to practice confession uh, so if you're Orthodox or Catholic, that's easy. That's part of your tradition. If you're Protestant, you can still take time, set aside time on a monthly basis to examine your conscience and to confess your sins. Because you can't, no matter what you accomplish in life, if you don't have goodness, virtue, and the foundation of a rightly ordered soul, it, it will mean nothing. Uh, number five, the answer is always no, unless you ask. Um, you might ask yourself, why are the people in my life who have influence or power or money you know, not doing more for me? Like, why aren't they coming to me with ideas? The reality is you have to come to them and ask, right? This is the same thing with donors. I do a lot of fundraising. You might have a donor who has, you know, they might be worth $500 million. They might be giving your organization 25,000 a year. And you might be sitting there saying, why on earth are they not giving me 500,000 a year? Like, I know they can afford it. Well, most of the time, you know, they want to be treated respectfully, they want to be engaged, right? They want to resonate with the mission. Most of the time they're not giving you a half million dollars is because no one has ever sat down with them and said, hey, I've got a really cool plan, here's, here's the impact, can I have $500,000? You would be surprised at how much, uh, how many doors can open up personally, professionally, if you literally just ask for something. Uh, number six, find your niche and own it and delegate the rest. Uh, you can make a lot more progress in your career if you find the, like one or two things that you're actually really good at 
and get better than the, get better than them than focusing on the areas that you're bad at and trying to make improvements. There might be some times when you have to improve in things that you're bad at, especially if it's actually part of your job responsibilities, but more often than not, you're gonna get further finding the one thing that you're really good at and, and making yourself great in that area. Uh, number seven, uh, scare yourself by getting in over your head from time to time. Uh, courage is not the absence of fear, uh, but it's moving forward uh, in, in, light of the, in spite of the fear that you feel in your, your chest. So if you're scaring yourself all the time, then pro something's probably wrong. But if, but if from time to time you're not saying, oh, oh crap, like I feel like I'm maybe a little in over my head, then I think you're also doing something wrong. Uh, another piece of advice, number eight, that a pastor gave me, uh, if everyone loves you, something might be wrong, but if everyone hates you, you're probably just being an asshole. <laughs> so. Uh, number nine, a good friend of mine recently told me, I've never taken a job that I know how to do. I've never taken a job that I know how to do. Uh, so often in life, you'll, you'll get the job first, right? You'll sell your ability to do the job, then you'll get the job, and then you have to learn the skills on the job. Or you're already currently in a job, and you see that in a, your organization has some need and you don't, know, you don't know how to fill that need, but you wanna be the person to fill that need, and so you'll sign up for the job, and then you'll like order the books on Amazon or pull up YouTube, and you'll literally teach yourself how to do that job. Um, number 10, uh, be the person who shows up with a solution or a plan to find a solution and not the one who just points out the problem. Number 11, uh, when you mess up in your first job, uh, give a simple apology, don't mention excuses or give a lengthy explanation. Uh, I actually learned that the first time that I was at ISI when I made some mistake with a donor and uh, my, our, the president at the time, Chris Long, you know, wrote a really angry sort of email in response. And so I decided instead of just saying, sorry, Chris, shouldn't have done it, won't happen again, I wrote, you know, like five paragraphs and then I sent it back to him with like all these other vice presidents CC'd on the email. And then I very quickly got pulled to the side and was like, no, Chris, Chris did not like that. Just apologize and don't do it. You know, he doesn't need a treatise on why you were actually right in making the mistake. Um, number 12, uh, don't let money be an obstacle to pursuing a bold dream. When I say that, I'm not saying pursue a bold dream without a financial plan, you know, because you can pursue a bold dream without a financial plan. What I'm saying is don't let money get in the way. Money is probably the easiest problem to solve in life. It's much harder to learn a skill or practice discipline. It's probably harder to get out of bed in the morning and say your prayers than it is to like raise a million dollars. Like that's, it's literally, it's true. Like if you have a good idea, if you have a sound plan to get there, you can find people who are gonna be willing to support that dream. That's the easy thing. It's much harder to practice self-discipline, so don't let money be an obstacle to pursuing your dreams. Uh, number 13 uh, gets back to the earlier point about job skills, career development as, see career development as creative problem solving. Um, you know, you might think you know what you wanna do now, you're probably gonna change your mind, change your jobs like multiple times by the time you're 30. And most of the things that you discover that you really like to do, you probably didn't even know before you got your job. You sort of, you, these, these talents, these skills were emergent based on uh, challenges that you have at work and then you teach yourself a skill and then you know, maybe that spins off and you start your own company with that new skill you learn. Maybe you don't go to work for a different organization learning the skill that you taught yourself on your job. So I think your passions are emergent and your approach to problem solving needs to be creative and that'll actually lead to the next stage or the next chapter in your career. Number 14, almost done, we got 17 here. Uh, reject the quote, I'm not smart enough to do what he or she did mentality. Reject the I'm not smart enough mentality. The three reasons for that. The first one is that it's almost never the smartest people that get ahead. Uh, it's the most competent, the most connected, the most disciplined, the most ambitious and the most kind people, uh, the people that treat each other well, uh, that actually make it ahead. Uh, number two, if you're in this room, you're probably smart enough to hold your own in most circles, so I wouldn't uh, worry about that at all. And number three, like me personally, as Johnny Burtka, like I'm rarely the smartest person in the room that I'm sitting in, uh, and that's okay, because it's like, okay, I know the things that I'm good at, 
and I lean into those things, and then the goal is just to hire and surround yourself with the most brilliant people as possible who can do the other things. And so I, you know, I actually enjoy, and this is the case of many of the professors, right, in this room, like I enjoy talking to them and hearing them go to a level of depth that I know is not only just interesting for me, but I know it's like my brain cannot function, I cannot plumb those depths <laughs> And so I'm, like, I'm happy that you can be here to explain that for me. And that should not make you feel insecure. That's actually, uh, you want to surround yourself with those kind of people. Uh, number 15, never burn a bridge unless it's absolutely necessary. Uh, in this conservative world in particular, these people are literally going to circle around your life. Like sometimes there might be seasons when you're working a ton with this person or that person. Then five or 10 years later, like they're always going to just keep coming back. So don't burn bridges unnecessarily. Uh, number 16, uh, there's almost zero correlation between having the correct ideology uh, and your competence uh, as an employee or as a person, right? I've known people who believe everything that I believe about politics who are just absolutely terrible, like dis dysfunctional at doing their job. Other people have different set of beliefs or ideas than I do who are just Ab absolutely amazing and crush it at their job. So there's, there's n disabuse yourself of the fact that there is some connection between believing the right ideas and actually being uh, competent in your work. And finally, number 17, uh, which is really sort of my theory of everything, uh, is to build an ecosystem. Uh, what I mean by that is, uh, you know, when it comes to economics, right, if you're going to have a healthy economy, you need basic ingredients. You need things like the rule of law, you need private property. Uh, if you're going to have a free society, you need certain institutions, churches, civil society for it to function. If you're going to have a healthy, you know, social life, a life with your friends, you really need to be a convening mechanism, right? You need to bring together people like you all, especially here at honors, the Honors Conference, bring together good people, good ideas, show them hospitality, get them in the same place, and it's from those moments and those experiences that exciting things will happen. New ideas will come to your mind, new career opportunities, ideas to start a new company or a new publication. Like, those don't happen in isolation. They happen when you're together and when you build out the right ecosystem with a spirit of hospitality. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, I think there's a lot going on that's wrong with the country. I think principles and ideas are important, but right now in order to fix our present crisis, I'd encourage you to be focused on uh, character development and also learning the skills that you need to make yourself indispensable to the organizations that you'll work for. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Johnny. It was really great. Thank you. Um, we'll, we'll move to about 15 minutes of questions, and you guys can just come right up. We won't do brainstorming for this one. So uh, make your way up to the microphone, and uh, let's go. Thank you so much for that amazing lecture. I, I have a quick question about number six on that advice okay. list. Uh, when, it, when it comes to college and being a student, one of the things that we've done our entire lives is learn how to write papers and take tests. And those are the only two skills that we really get a chance to build. So when it comes into entering into the, the more practical career, work-a-day world, um, what is a good way to discern what niches are really the right fit for us? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a good question. Um... And I'm trying to think of the, you know, the, how do you discern what the right, you know, I, in one sense, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I know, like, personally what I did in my own life, which was, all right, I had a, a passion, you know, like, why was I a Christian studies and French major in college? It had nothing to do with my career. It was just that at the time, I was really into theology and I was really into to French, right? And I did a graduate program in theology just because I was interested in theology. And then I had, you know, sort of some theological uh, crisis or meltdown. I was trying to figure out, you know, what denomination I was a part of. And so I was like, man, I should stop pursuing this theology track as a profession and probably fall back on my mentors, you know, and that's when I called up my Hillsdale professors. That's when I called up the people that, you know, I was associated with. And I was like, what on earth should I do? And uh, decided, you know, I, w I also had an interest in politics, 
uh, although it was significantly less than my interest in theology. Um, and so I literally applied to like a dozen organizations. I interviewed at all these jobs. I get turned down in all these places. And then when I got the job offer at ISI, they basically said, this is the first time when I, in 2014, you can either be a program officer or a development officer. Like, you pick which one. And for whatever reason, I thought, oh, like I know, you know, I did some sales when I worked for my like family's business. Sales sounds interesting. That sounds like it's a great practical skill for me to learn. So I just chose the development track. And then my passion for development sort of emerged through doing it. So, you know, I, I think it's, you have to have the things that you, just like the process for picking a major, you obviously picked a major that you love studying. Uh, but also, I think with a career, it's sort of some combination of like, do I believe in the organization's mission? Uh, you know, do the people, the mentors that are surrounding me, like, think it's a good opportunity? And then kind of just throw yourself into it, and you sort of figure it out as you go. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hi, thank you so much for that. Um, I know I probably speak for a lot of people here who say, um, like we're very busy people with academics. We also fo have to focus on skill development, uh, on all the various on-campus things that we're doing and maintaining relationships. Uh, and um, I'm drawing from a lot of personal experience here. Uh, one of the things that you uh, talked about was um, delegating and um, finding ways to, I guess, um, hone um, or find your niche, hone your skills and find uh -huh. your niche. Um, but what if you're in a place where, um, yeah, I'm, here I'll back up. Uh, what would you recommend to somebody who's in a place where there aren't just a lot of people to delegate to and where there's not a lot of resources to draw from and, or even besides all that, it's just experiencing burnout and through a lot of the day-to-day -day cycles of managing all of those things in life. What type of advice would you give, out, give to the burnt-out college student? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, again, I'm kind of going to, I guess, just to make an appeal to sort of personal experience. Um, but, you know, I think you can probably have, two, like, there's a couple different types of jobs. There's the job at, like, an established institution where, like, the role that you will get at that institution, even as an entry-level employee, is, like, is a delegated responsibility, right? So... Uh, Kanan Harris does society, he starts societies. Like he's the society man at ISI and he's incredibly good at it. He does it over and over again and he just gets them going, gets them rolling, right? We have other people that do different tasks on the program team. Similarly in development, you know, you have, it's not your major gift officer that's writing grant proposals or that's planning what goes out in the mail. Like you have, you know, you have a database, you have leads, you have people that are on your caseload, and your one job is literally to work the phones and travel the country like meeting with donors to raise money. So sometimes it's like the delegation is literally built into your job responsibilities. Other times, like when I left ISI to go to the American Conservative, it was totally different. It was basically like a startup. You know, you only had like seven or eight, seven or eight people instead of 30 people. And you literally, like anything that you wanted to do, you had to do every aspect of it yourself. And so, um, you know, that is exhausting. And you certainly do, can feel that, you know, burnout. But I also, there is also something great about just being like totally thrown in off the deep end over your head and have to figure out like, how do I, because even that act of juggling, and this is what you have to do as a college student, because you not only have exams, not only have things to read, but if you're like a junior or senior, you're probably involved with a number of campus groups where you have leadership positions. And so like when you start in college, you really don't have anything to do besides like read and take exams. But by the end, you feel like you're like a CEO or a political figure because you're like leading Bible studies and giving talks and you're on the board of your fraternity and you're, you're just doing everything. And so I think being thrown, one of the challenges I think that form your character is like, okay, let's say everything is thrown at you. How do you decide what to prioritize? And you have to be laser focused on like, what are the most important things that if I don't do these things, I literally fail, you know? And what are the areas where if I drop this ball, like things are still moving in the right direction? So it's a challenge, but Thank yeah. you. Um, I was wondering what your recommendations are regarding Rule 14, I believe that that was, which is the yeah. one about not letting finances um, hold you back from pursuing dreams. I was wondering what your recommendations are on activities or places to go to for 
refining dreams so that there's a touch of practicality in them. They're not pipe dreams, but they're still ambitious, but, but they retain an element of reality. Where is the best way to refine them um, and then find? Uh... Um, I mean, I think it's, I generally, I think dreams should like, if you're, if you're trying to start something, it should exist to, to solve a particular problem that exists, right? So if you're starting a business, like there's some gap like in the market that you're trying to fill by creating a particular product. Uh, if you're starting a publication, it's because you feel like the other publications out there aren't representing the particular point of view that you're, you're trying to get across, similarly for an institution. And so um, y you might have another dream, like I just want to be a great English lit professor, which is, you know, in, in which case you, you know, then have to find the track that you need to go on in order to get to that place. So to, I think in, in terms of pursuing your dreams, I think getting... Um, much more practical and concrete and saying what problem do I want to solve is, a bet, is a, you know, the best way to get there. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to come to speak with us today. I really liked point 17 on building an ecosystem, but mm. could you elaborate on what you mean by that and then how you do that? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, yeah, how do you, do, you know, how do you do it? Um, I think there's a, I mean, I think in, to some extent it's just doing, you know, sort of on the practical level, it's just doing it. I mean, I think there's, um, you know, you probably have some friends that for whatever, like they're the ones that just always initiate something. Like they always, you know, invite you over to their house. They always like, they're always proposing something for you to do, something for you to get involved with. And then you have, it, normally if you're one of those people who likes to host, likes to show hospitality, you probably ask yourself from time to time, well, gosh, like I show hospitality to all these people, like I'm the convening mechanism, but so many of the people who come and hang out with me never like, they don't reciprocate. They never like host their own thing. They never invite me to do something. Like I'm always the one doing it. And I think that's just, that's just the way it is. Like there are some people that really do hospitality and do it well. And I think if you want the ecosystem, um, yeah, it, it helps to like latch on to someone who really loves hosting and creating those kind of environments and like being part of what they're doing, but I think you just have to kind of do it yourself, you know? And I mean, similar thing even with um, various people that I've hired, you know, thinking about people that I hired at the American Conservative, for example, r reporters, writers, you know, a lot of that just came out of, we decided to do these dinner salons once a month on various hot button topics going on in politics. Uh, we would pick one person to be the speaker, and then we'd just invite a list of like 12 or 15 interesting people. And those people had no clue why you know, we were inviting them. It was just like, you, you've written something interesting. Like, would you come to this dinner we're hosting? And then all of a sudden, you know, month after month, we'd have these dinners. And then you know, after the dinner, we'd go to the bar, we'd hang out, we'd talk for hours. And then you know, three months later, some position opens up for a reporter. And it's, you know, it's like, well, who... Who am I going to hire for that? And it's like, oh, I'll hire this guy who I've, you know, seen in person. I've seen how they've interacted with other people. I see the ideas that they have. You know, you, you hire from that ecosystem. Or if you were to start a new institution, a new think tank or something, you'd say, well, who do, who do I hire? You're going to hire the people that you're, you know, that are part of the ecosystem that you build. So, yeah, I just think you got to throw yourself in there and do it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Johnny. Um, what is, you said never burn a bridge unless absolutely necessary. When might it be absolutely necessary? Or another way of, <laughs> or another way of asking the question might be, what is the difference between burning a bridge and either cutting someone off or letting someone go? Hmm. Oh, that's tough to figure out when it's, you know, I mean, I think there are some, um, that's a good question. I mean, I, I think there's, there's obviously some, you know, th there are some issues, there's are, there are some situations where you just come to ir irreconcilable dif right, differences, and those could be, um, I guess, you know, you, you might think of it like in the journalism space or in the Twitter space, you know, like there is a sort of a, a dunking on other people that goes on that I think is you know, that, that's probably not quite burning a bridge. That's more like, okay, we, we believe in different ideas, and so we're going to kind of like get in the ring, and I'm going to throw a shot at you, you throw one back, but you sort of, I don't know, there, there's maybe an understanding that this is not really like, you're not fundamentally trying to destroy the other person or their character. You know, so I think that uh, is probably okay. You know, I think 
the level of, um, you know, really trying. I, I, so, so I would say unless there is like some some very clear moral or like existential reason why the the thing that someone else what they stand for is just so abhorrent that it can't be tolerated, I think generally you should maintain a sense of charity and goodwill uh, toward those people, just because it's gonna, you know, I I, I think it's gonna take you farther. I, I think. I think you only burn the bridge if you can't not burn the bridge. Like, right, if you have a clear sense that, like, there, we have to cut ties over, you know, like, it, it will be very clear to you that you have to burn the bridge just because there's no other way to do it. If you're asking yourself, oh, crap, you know, I, I don't know, I wrote this thing and I'm just really not sure, like, is it going to burn the bridge or not? Like, then you probably shouldn't burn that bridge, right? Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. This question's a little similar in nature, but you talked about divisiveness um, and people's willingness to be divisive and, and maybe today in a way that's not always helpful. I'm wondering when is the time to be divisive? And then also maybe is there a time to sit back, right? And let the other people be divisive because you're just staying right where you are and not moving. And in that way you're being divisive. Which so I see that as maybe a more helpful type of device. Can you clarify the, sorry, the last part? Well, let's, so let's say you think something, right? And I think something completely different. I might not attack you for that thing, right? But me just believing this thing and acting on this thing, right, could make you attack me. Mm -hmm. So you're the, you're, the, you're the one bringing yeah. the divisiveness to the, you know, the public arena, and I'm just doing my thing. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that's a tactic. Basically, that's a tactic to employ. I'm not saying to, you, you ought to employ it, but that approach is a tactic that people who don't have a lot of, who don't have power basically use to get more attention for their particular cause. Like, so if you, if you represent an, an, obs, you know, an obscure non-mainstream position, what you're gonna try to do is like provoke, you're gonna punch up, right, at people that have more influence and power than you. And the goal is simply that they punch down really hard because then all of a sudden they blow up whatever cause you're trying to focus on. I mean, it's, it could be a similar thing with like, you know, a protester or a rioter, you know, you push, you keep pushing the boundaries, pushing the boundaries, pushing the boundaries until there's a response, like there's a, a crackdown on you from whatever, you know, law and order sort of response. And then all of a sudden you can flip from being the one who's provoking to being the victim, which then amplifies your message. So uh, I, don't, I don't necessarily think that, um, I, I, I guess I, I wouldn't endorse that approach. I, there could be some situations where you, you know, you, um, you know, the cause is is actually just. You are defending a just cause, and you're in a society that's wicked that believes something that's totally unjust. And so you might uh, tactically sort of employ those types of of strategies. Um, but I guess, yeah, that's what I would say about that. Thank you very much, Johnny. All right.